Hi, welcome uh, everybody. Welcome to the Javed Mofagian Cinema. Delighted that so many of you could uh, join us this evening. I just wanted to begin by acknowledging that we're on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the, S the Swasson, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh. Uh, my name is Am Hall. I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. Tonight, uh, the event Suncor presents Walrus Talks Energy. Uh, some of you uh, might be in the building here for the first time. We have a, we're about the fourth year uh, from this building opening up, and we're having well over 50,000 people a year come through for cultural and community engagement events. And you can check out all of the other things that are happening at sfuwoodwards.ca. But this summer, we're going to, for the fourth year in a row, have the Indian Summer Festival. And in September, Vancouver International <coughs> Film Festival uh, will be here uh, as well. Now, to help us uh, start the show, I uh, ask you to join me in welcoming the editor and the co-publisher of Walrus Magazine, John McFarlane. Thank you, Am, and uh, thank all of you uh, and everyone at SFU and SFU Public Square for hosting this edition of the Walrus Talks. We're, three, we're thrilled to be here in Vancouver tonight. Actually, uh, coming from Toronto, we're thrilled to be almost anywhere tonight. <laughs> and I'm not talking only about the weather. In fact, it occurred to me today to, to propose to you a trade. <laughs> we'll take John Tortorella <laughs> if you'll take Rob Ford. I had to ask. I also want to thank Suncar, Suncor, our presenting sponsor, which is dedicated to providing forums like this for constructive debates about sustainable energy future for Canada and the world. If you don't know us, the Walrus Foundation is a national, charitable, nonprofit organization with an educational mandate to create forums for conversation on matters vital to Canadians. One of those forums is the Walrus Magazine, which is published 10 times a year. When you open an issue of the Walrus, which just celebrated its 10th anniversary, you'll find stories and conversations on all sorts of topics, politics, culture, the environment, business, technology, art, sports, and foreign affairs. But you'll also find those stories, conversations, and more on other Walrus platforms, on our website, thewalrus.ca, on Walrus TV, in Walrus eBooks, and on stages like this from coast to coast to coast. The Walrus, we like to say, has no wings. It has no ideological bias. It's proudly and resolutely independent. The Walrus Foundation is supported by advertising and sponsorships, by subscriptions, newsstand and ticket sales, by foundations and by individual donors who are part of the Walrus Campaign for Optimistic Canadians, because they believe what we do is important. We are deeply grateful to all of them, and to you for joining us here tonight. This event, Suncor Presents the Walrus Talks Energy, is one of four energy talks we're hosting across the country. They are live streamed at thewalrus.ca and will also be available on Walrus TV. Our goal is to, is to keep tonight's conversation going, so please go to thewalrus.ca and see how it's unfolding. Of course, you can also subscribe to the Walrus magazine, where energy issues are always on the agenda. And think about signing up for OSCAR, the Oil Sands Question and Answer blog and newsletter at osqar.suncor.com. OSCAR was created by Suncor to facilitate a constructive dialogue and its weekly posts are filled with answers to questions from people like you and me. Conversations are never ending on social media, of course, and if Twitter is your thing, the hashtag for tonight's event is hashtag Walrus Talks. Okay, here's how the Walrus Talks works. Each of our seven speakers has exactly seven minutes. There is no MC. They will come on stage and introduce themselves. If you want to know more about them, you can refer to your program because we know you can all read. <laughs> Each seven-minute talk will stand alone. The speakers will not refer to those before or after them. So that's it, seven speakers for seven minutes each. 
Our hope is that an hour from now, we'll have a lot to think and talk about at the post-talk reception, and of course out there in the world. At any rate, that's our goal. Just before I disappear, I'd like to thank our speakers in advance. <clears throat> we know that by the end of the evening, we'll all be the beneficiaries of their original thinking on a subject crucial to Canada's future. So thank you to Carbon Talks' Shauna Sylvester, the Global Mail's Gary Mason, Mars Discovery District's Tom Rand, University of Victoria's K.K. Yanuksuk, Judith Sayers, UBC's Bill Rees, Axe and Water Technologies' Jonathan Rohn, and Student Energy's Callie Taylor. Once again, thank you all for coming. Let's begin. Hello everyone, my name is Shauna Sylvester and it is delightful to be here with you tonight. I want us to start my presentation by taking you back to my dinner table and I'm 14 years old. And my father is a Canadian hist historian and he would spend hours regaling us with facts and figures about Canadian history that he had honed over several years of teaching uh, undergraduates. And there was this one night that my brother David and I got into this very deep discussion about the coal mine strike of 1913. And this is an Enimo strike. And my dad said, the problem with the two of you is you've never read Harold Innes. And I said, Harold Innes? Who's Harold Innes? And my brother, who would never get caught out on one of my father's appeals to an obscure text, got up and said, Harold Innes? Oh yeah, I read him. He's that staple guy. And my dad said, yes, always finding the teachable moment. And he said, what did he teach us? He taught us that our political history and our economic identity is wrapped up. It's shaped by the exploitation and the exporting of our raw resources, our staples, fur, metal, fossil fuels. And then he paused for dramatic effect, as only he could do. And he said, you know, we'll never be more than the hewers of wood and the drawers of water supplying advanced industrial countries if we can't see beyond just being a resource economy. Well, I learned more about Harold Innes over the years, but as our Canadian manufacturing sector took on growth and we became much more of a service-based, knowledge-based economy, Innes kind of was relegated to the history books where he belonged. Because after all, he described an old economy, an old traditional economy. And we were much more confident. We were active on the international arena. We'd moved beyond that. Until maybe last year, Harold Innes came up for me in a pretty big way during the last provincial election. That's when Premier Christy Clark announced that we are going to adopt liquid natural gas. Now, it wasn't the, the, the adoption of LNG, that announcement, that that was such a surprise. LNG is not new, it's not innovative, many countries have got it. It was that what happened in that month is the whole narrative of our BC economy shifted. We shifted from being this service-centered, knowledge-based economy, a global leader in climate change, and we shifted to be talking about ourselves as a resource-based economy again. This became really clear to me last week when I was in, in Brussels at the European Union facilitating uh, discussions on renewable energy. And it was fascinating to hear the discussions in Europe because they weren't shaped on how are we going to meet the hungry energy demands of Asia with shale gas. The conversations there were all about how do we get to renewables, 100% renewables if that was ever possible. And it wasn't climate change that was the imperative for this shift. It was economic opportunity. It was job creation, innovation, lower energy costs energy security. And I listened to the Europeans present, and they really do like to present, the more the better. I came away and I started to think about our energy here in BC in three different ways. And the first way I would call the staple after Harold Innes. And it's characterized by oil, natural gas, um, LNG, and it is commodity-centered and export-oriented. It requires large investments, large infrastructure, and it promises high returns 
but for very high environmental costs. The second is the grid. This is the electrical side of things. Big hydro generally connects also run of the river, coal-fired electricity, perhaps some wind. It's centralized, it's highly regulated. And like a mainframe computer or telephone line, the cost of the infrastructure can be quite high, and the cost to distribute and transport that energy is borne in our utility rates. The third, I'll call the network. So if the grid is the telephone lines and the mainframe computer, the network is more our smartphones. It's the personal computers. It's the decentralized model of energy distribution. It's about district energy nodes where energy is produced by local communities or by the consumers. And energy is seen much less as a commodity as much as it's seen as a process. And it depends on many different kinds of technology. So those three, I actually think we have all three in BC. But as I started to think about our, our future and our new narrative, I wondered how much longer could we hold on to that mix in BC? As we start accelerating the development to LNG, what are we losing? Well, let's look at some of the questions around LNG. Is, Japan, is the price going to hold? Is Japan and China going to want our LNG when it's not at market and there's so many others that are? China's number one priority in their latest five-year plan is energy sufficiency. They are the largest investors in renewables. They're just going to keep investing in renewables. Will they choose to increase their dependence on fossil fuel? It's a question. I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the business case for LNG. And in terms of LNG, we're going to have to create Site C. We're going to need to build out our distribution system. We're going to have to fortify that grid a great deal more to power those LNG facilities. How is that going to be paid for? Are we going to start seeing in our electricity bills the distribution and the cost of the grid? And then from a climate change, let's look at our GHG profile. Let there be no mistake that as we invest in LNG, even if it's the cleanest LNG in the world, that we are going to meet our climate targets. It's a move in the opposite direction. So when I look at what we're losing, I also look at what the clean tech sector has brought. This is a sector that has been growing very fast. 2.5 billion in 2011 to our economy, 57% jump from where it was in 2008. A major job creator major innovation. It's providing us with a globally competitive knowledge-based industry. But that's not where we're putting our energy. That's not where we're putting our focus. Instead, we're going back to what we know well, how to be a hewer of wood and a drawer of water. It's like Walt Patterson says, we're embracing the fire age when the future is in the digital age. So I'm thinking it might be time to invite our premier over for a Sunday night dinner. I'm thinking that perhaps my father could share some of the lessons and the wisdom of Harold Innes and say that we can be more than a staple economy. We can be leaders in global energy and clean energy. We have the brains, we have the technology, we have the understanding. It's just that we have to have the political will and we have to see the economic opportunity and have the confidence to compete globally. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Gary Mason. My topic this evening is the political landscape, and it's a subject I'm happy to report is superbly timed, given that the politi political topography in BC and Alberta, as it pertains to energy, and pipelines in particular, is changing at warp speed. It's changing so fast, in fact, that it, it has created a new level of instability in energy matters in Canada. Recent events have left both opponents and proponents of pipelines wondering what it all means. Just consider what's happened in the last couple of weeks. The Premier of Alberta, Alison Redford, was forced out of office by a coup. Just before that, her associate minister of education and one of the brightest stars in the Alberta government, Donna Kennedy Glanz, quit to sit as an independent. With Ms. Redford's downfall 
Jim Prentice's name has suddenly been thrust into the spotlight. Mr. Prentice, of course, is the former federal cabinet minister who has taken on a critical role for Enbridge in building relations with First Nation communities along the path of the proposed Northern Gateway Pipeline. He is now under enormous pressure to run for Miss Redford's job. If he takes up the challenge, as many expect he will, then Enbridge will have lost the one person many believe gave the company at least a semblance of hope in its bid to win over the hearts and minds of Native leaders opposed to the project. In BC, meantime, John Horgan and Mike Farnworth declared their intention to seek the leadership of the NDP. It's altogether possible that they will be the only two people in the race. Both of their candidacies have profound implication for the energy landscape in the province because their stance around pipelines, most notably, is at odds with the party's current position and at odds with a significant segment of the party's political base as well. More about that in a minute. And then at the municipal level, we saw the mayor of Burnaby, Derek Corrigan, make headlines with his declaration that he'll stand in the path of any bulldozer that tries to carve up land for the proposed Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion. If nothing, it was a grandiose reminder that the fight over pipelines in BC is not simply a federal and provincial issue. While cities like Burnaby and Vancouver do not have any constitutional leverage when it comes to energy policy, mayors like Derek Corrigan and Gregor Robertson do have sway with a broad segment of the electorate in Greater Vancouver. It's an influence that federal and provincial leaders ignore at their peril. Meantime in Ottawa, the man who has been in charge of the critical natural resources ministry, Joe Oliver, was promoted to finance minister making way for a relative unknown, Greg Rickford, to take over one of the most challenging ministries in Ottawa. And that's all been in the last couple of weeks. Remarkable, really. (laughs) Now, obviously, I don't have time to dissect all of these developments, but let me zero in on a couple I believe have the potential to most radically alter the political terrain around energy in the West. The first is the fall of Alison Redford. While there are many happy she's gone, I can tell you the oil industry is not. Ms. Redford was the most activist premier on behalf of the oil and gas sector in Alberta since the blue-eyed sheik himself, Peter Lougheed. She advocated hard for a national energy strategy. She pushed to revamp the province's oil and gas regulations, changes the industry has been demanding for years. She was a passionate promoter of Keystone. And after some early missteps, she also built a solid working relationship with BC Premier Christy Clark, particularly around energy and pipelines. Now she's gone, and the vacuum her absence has created has been filled with fear and uncertainty. There is nothing the business world abhors more than uncertainty. Oil and gas executives in the province have lost their biggest booster. Say what you will about Alison Redford's failings as a retail politician, She was a bright and articulate voice on behalf of the province's energy sector. Now that sector doesn't know who will replace her and whether that person will bring the same drive and commitment on their behalf to the job. Energy leaders have no idea whether, in a bid to see the progressive conservatives occupy a larger part of the political center in the province, the new leader will become more dove than hawk on energy policy. And that has created nothing short of dread in the oil and gas towers of downtown Calgary. So that's energy destabilizer number one. Energy destabilizer number two is the BC NDP leadership race. There is little question that Adrian Dix's decision to come out against the Kinder Morgan expansion severely damaged his party's chances of winning last spring's election. NDP supporters in small resource-based towns in the interior and the north particularly unionized workers and their families, deserted the party in favor of the resource-friendlier liberals. Mr. Farnworth and Mr. Horgan both know this and are now making sounds like they plan to address this matter with a policy platform that treads a careful line. They need to keep the environmental wing of the party happy 
while showing resource towns that were once the backbone of the NDP that they are still on their side. I think both candidates will remain firmly against Northern Gateway. For the NDP, that is a dead issue. Where they will depart significantly from Mr. Dix, and many in the party for that matter, is on Kinder Morgan. Barring some unforeseen cataclysmic event, one of these two men is going to be the next NDP leader in BC. Both want to find a way to support Kinder Morgan without imploding their party. It will be a very, very, very difficult thing to do. Just think about our friend Derek Corrigan that I mentioned earlier. He is an influential New Democrat. He's, he's saying Kinder Morgan over his dead body. So is Gregor Robertson, a former NDP MLA and now leader of Vision Vancouver, a civic party whose supporters, in many instances, are also provincial New Democrats. That gives you some idea of just how hard it's going to be for Mr. Farnworth or Mr. Horgan to broker some kind of deal around Kinder Morgan. Yet that is precisely what one or the other is going to try and do if they win. In the last election, the Liberals successfully framed the New Democrats as the party of no when it came to jobs. Mr. Farnworth and Mr. Horgan believe the NDP needs to be the party of yes if it's ever going to be more than just the official opposition in BC. In the next year, one of these two men will significantly alter the political environment around energy in BC. Finally, let me finish with a couple of prognostications. Northern Gateway is dead. It will not happen. A redesigned version of it will, may surface one day down the road, but not likely with Enbridge as the proponent and not without a refinery or crude oil upgrade component as part of the plan. Kinder Morgan will go ahead because the company has avoided many of the mistakes that Enbridge has made. It will go ahead and Derek Corrigan will not lay down in front of a bulldozer in an attempt to stop it. Those are my predictions. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Tom Rand. Uh, ever since the 1970s, when the Club of Rome first proposed there may be strict limits to economic growth, debate around economic growth has focused on innovation versus scarcity. So optimists would argue that human ingenuity and markets would burst through any limit because you can substitute one thing for another. Pessimists would look at the underlying math and say, you can't have an economy grow forever in a finite world. Innovation may push the boundary out for a while, but you can't do that forever. Until now, this argument has been an interesting but highly abstract argument between economists. The jury is still out, I would argue. But today, catastrophic climate change from unchecked carbon emissions as a modern variant on a recurring theme about limits is different. It's different because now the challenge is, or the question is, can innovation replace something before it's scarce? And that's a very different question indeed. Modern optimists, clean tech bulls, would argue that clean energy innovation will come into the market, mitigate climate risk, and climate change will be a bump in the road. And if it happens, we'll have more innovation to adapt to that. Bump in the road at most, on our way to continued economic growth. A modern day a pessimist, a climate bear, would say climate disruption is of such significant uh, a threat that it threatens economic growth itself. It's not a bump in the road to economic growth, it's an end to that road. We all have a stake in this fight. Well, the bulls are looking pretty healthy to me. $250 billion was spent on clean energy infrastructure in the past 12 months. And many up and comers coming down the pipe, many innovations can go toe to toe with fossil fuels. I'll give you some examples. Solar is on a tear since 2008. The, the price of a panel has come down four-fifths since that time. And there may have been government intervention and government support required at the beginning, as there is for any industry of significance. But the training wheels are coming off. And high-profile casualties like Solyndra are signs of a maturing market, where manufacturers with scale and low cost begin to dominate, just like it happened for the automotive sector in the previous century. There's not a lot of Studebakers are around today, and cars seem a lot nicer. 
Rooftop, in particular, is on a tear. Rooftop solar competes with the retail cost of electricity. And so much solar is going up on so many roofs that the big incumbents, the big utilities, are seeing their very business model under threat from something they thought was a sideshow. Large-scale solar is beginning to compete on the wholesale price of electricity. Toronto's own, Canada's own, Morgan Solar will be in the market this year with their long-anticipated concentrated PV systems, which can produce solar power for five cents a kilowatt hour at scale. That beats new natural gas. That beats new coal. Energy storage innovation is next. Canada's own HydroStore has the lowest cost grid-scale energy storage I've seen, and their first commercial project will be running in Aruba this year, storing wind power all night long demonstrating the economic proposition that renewables plus storage can beat diesel on reliability and cost today. Today, diesel, tomorrow, coal. Even biofuels are beginning to get competitive. Woodland Biofuels is operating a demonstration plant in Sarnia right now, producing cellulosic ethanol and demonstrating the economics that they can produce ethanol from wood chips, agricultural waste, more cheaply than the gasoline it replaces. As a matter of fact, Woodland is, is, is in line to be Canada's lowest cost producer of liquid fuels, including the incumbents. So clearly, clean tech innovation is coming down the pipe and can compete head to head with fossil fuels. But what are we really up against? The climate bear has woken up, and at 0.8 degrees Celsius of warming, we can hear it growling. Opening shots typical of this fight, prolonged drought in California and the American Southwest, Weather patterns that have changed so much, they flood Calgary and Toronto. A typhoon in the Philippines that was horrific to watch, even on television. Droughts, fires, floods of biblical proportion in Australia. These are a pattern that are clearly emerging, and it's nothing compared to what the climate bear has in store. Even ExxonMobil and BP's own projections have us shooting past 4 degrees C by the end of this century. Realistically, business as usual will get us somewhere between four and six degrees of warming this century. Think of that heat as energy, because it's not just warmth we're worried about, it's violent weather. We are adding, by trapping heat with our additional carbon dioxide from emissions in the atmosphere, the equivalent, the energy equivalent of 400,000 Hiroshima bombs every day. That's an awful lot of energy for the climate bear to use to wreak havoc. So the question is not whether innovation can displace fossil fuels. Of course it can. We're doing that right now. The question is, can it scale fast enough to wrestle down the climate bear? To stop near 2 degrees C, we need to leave three quarters of our known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. These are fossil fuel reserves that sit on the balance sheets of the energy incumbents. We also have to replace that with something else which means we need to roughly triple the amount of spending that even optimistically we think will get spent on clean energy over the next couple of decades. So the bull is healthy, but I think it needs some steroids. <laughs> we know what those steroids look like. This is well-trod territory, a price on carbon, mandatory aggressive targets, government-backed green bonds to accelerate capital into the sector. That's no secret. What I'm interested in, well, what's the role of the incumbents in this process? If I was an energy incumbent and I'm spending exploratory money to find more reserves that I can't burn, let's be generous and say they can burn half. Well, every dollar I spend finding more reserves is finding more unburnable carbon. I'm spending money increasing my risk. That's not a good deal for my investors. What I might want to do is spend at least some of that exploratory money collaborating with some of these emerging clean tech leaders to create a new asset class, a series of low carbon energy assets that can be developed. Enbridge has invested in Morgan Solar. One of the reasons they did it was because they want to put the capital into those projects that have an internal rate of return in excess of 35%. A woodland biofuels commercial plant has an internal rate of return twice that of an oil sands project and much lower long-term risk. So what's stopping a Suncor woodland collaboration? Habits of mind, probably. Habits of mind. References to the Club of Rome or limits to economic growth are treated with derision by mainstream economists today as if it was some sort of neo-Malthusian throwback by an unsophisticated Luddite who didn't really know what innovation did. 
It's not a question of whether innovation can displace fossil fuels. F- fossil fuels. <laughs> fossil fuels. <laughs> it's a question of whether they can scale up fast enough to wrestle that bear down. What keeps me up at night is not the health of the bulls. It's the strength of the bear. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. It's great to see so many people out here to discuss energy. Aklama Kakeanasux, Hupachasak Sup Nichanathot. My English name is Judah Sayers. I come from the Hupachasak peoples that the city of Port Alberni has invaded our territory. And um, I'd like to acknowledge tonight as well that we are on Coast Salish, unceded territories, and acknowledge uh, my friends in the Tsleil-Waututh, Squamish, and Musqueam nations. Can't talk energy today without talking about First Nations. I'd like you to think in your mind, think ahead, 10, 15 years. What is the earth going to look like? What are the tar sands going to be doing to the earth? What are the pipelines going to be doing to the land? What are the tankers going to be doing to our oceans? What is the temperature going to be doing to our water? What about our health, the air, clean drinking water? We are definitely at the point where we need to have very serious conversations, and that's why it really is exciting to me to see so many people coming out to have this discussion. As First Nations people, we are part of the land, we are part of the water, we are part of the sky. Our responsibilities to Mother Earth are great. You know, our don't really have a definition of sustainability. But one of our teachers is that we must leave enough behind for many generations, many generations. And when you think 10, 15, 20 years down the road, are they going to be able to fish sockeye? Are they going to be able to strip cedar? Are they going to be able to gather medicinal plants? And I'm not sure. But you know, as First Nations people, we are rising up. We are using our voices to protect what's important to us. We have constitutionally protected rights. And Section 35 was put in the Constitution to protect those rights. And with those rights, whether it's the right to fish, the right to hunt, the right to gather, you have to have ecosystems. But you know, the courts have said that governments can infringe on our rights if it can be justified. And what does that justification look like? And it's always jobs in the economy versus First Nations rights. Who wins and who loses? At some point, they're going to infringe so much that there won't be anything left. And so what was the use of Section 35? But we're never going to let it get that way. First Nations people will be going to courts. They will be laying in front of the bulldozers. They will be using every method they have available to them to protect what's important to them. And I think that's why the lesson to companies that want to come in and develop energy of any sort needs to sit down at the very beginning and say, this is what we'd like to do. What is your concerns? How can we help protect your water? How can we help make sure that the habitat that supports your moose or your elk or your caribou will still continue? First Nations people are not opposed to development. They are opposed to development 
that is going to destroy our rights. In British Columbia, 125 out of 203 First Nations are involved in energy projects, renewable energy. And many of those First Nations have two and three and four projects. Wonderful projects, Kanaka Bar. They're building a 50 megawatt uh, run of the river project on Quayote Creek with Interjex. We have many on the island. We have First Nations that are involved in wind. Souk First Nation is an amazing example of solar and solar technology, and they want to build a wind farm. The issue now is that um, the BC government has turned their attention to LNG and offering very limited opportunity in renewable energy. We're going backwards in this province, backwards, because we want LNG, let them create any kind of power that they want. First Nations are saying, we want renewable power. Maybe it can't be for all of it. You know, it's no longer acceptable to be creating more and more greenhouse gases that are going to impact everyone's lives, everyone's land, everyone's water. It's no longer acceptable to be flooding thousands of hectares of land, destroying First Nations heritage sites, cultural sites, burial sites, where they exercise their rights. The conversation has got to change. The conversation is what can we do better? How can we use more renewables instead of using some of the same old things that we want to do? Why is it acceptable that one energy, the LNG industry, gets to do whatever they want? How many other industries get to do whatever they want? <laughs> what about laws and policies? So First Nations and energy have to go hand in hand. British Columbia, Aboriginal title hasn't been resolved. We need to be consulted. International law says that we have the free prior and informed consent. We should be saying yes to these projects. And I want you to know that there are power, independent power companies in British Columbia that when a First Nation says no because the creek has fish or the creek is a sacred creek, those industries walk away. And so they should. Because if you can't find ways to mitigate damages or to prevent the damages, why should First Nations always be the ones losing their rights when they are constitutionally protected? It's about a way of life, and it's important. And I think the goals of all people, we share a lot. We want to have a sustainable future. We want to protect the pristine areas of our country that we can go to. We want to be able to go out and fish, not for livelihood, for recreation, for food. All of those things are things that we share. And we need to be more vocal about what is acceptable and what isn't. We need to make it more mm -hmm. of an elec election issue and an issue that we all care about, not just the group that's here tonight, but every single person in this, when you build a project up in the north, people in the cities don't live with the effects. It's the First Nations. They live in the shadow of the dams and don't have electricity. They have their lands flooded. We have to be able to look at the benefits and the effects to everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to share my views with you and look forward to more discussion on these issues as they become more and more vital to this country and for the very First Nations that have been here since time memorial. Kleko, Kleko. Good evening, everyone. My name is William Rees. I'm an uh, ecologist by training, a systems ecologist. And I want to bring a little bit of the skepticism of science to any claim of sustainability and a global overview to our evening's discussions. 
The context for this evening is that we are in already a state of overshoot. The world, the human community, is currently using even renewable resources approximately 50% faster than they can regenerate in nature. This is clearly unsustainable for very long. We're living by liquidating our assets, by depleting our capital. The primary driver of this is a period in history that we've come to take as the norm, the recent eight generations of the explosive growth of human population and infrastructure, but this recent period, just 200 years, a tiny fraction of 1% of human history is the single most anomalous or abnormal period in the history of humanity. But the point for tonight is that it's entirely funded by the abundance of wealth generated by cheap, abundant fossil fuel. Secondly, what goes up must come down. No species, no system can grow forever in a finite space. And indeed, if you look at uh, the history of human civilizations, uh, to quote one of the most famous historians of this in his book, um, The Collapse of Complex Societies, what is perhaps most intriguing in the evolution of human societies is the regularity with which the pattern of increasing complexity is interrupted by collapse. If we remain on a business-as-usual course, as we seem doggedly determined to do in British Columbia and Canada, we will be contributing to two avenues in which this collapse seems increasingly inevitable. The first is accelerating climate change and a whole variety of other ecological degradations that we haven't even begun to, to address yet. We are already at a point on the planet where arguably the unaccounted costs of growth exceed the benefits. This is an unusual period in our history, a period of uneconomic growth, which makes no economic, let alone ecological sense, and in the end, it could bring us down. Alternately, rising demand, diminishing supply in energy, minerals, fisheries, and so on and so forth, competition for capital, unrepayable debt, and the increasing costs for everything uh, may well create a situation in which economies one by one implode. We're seeing evidence of that already. The evidence is clear. Climate change is happening. There is no question. We've seen a 0.8 degree increase in mean global temperature. We have seen that extremely hot weather events have increased by a factor of 50 in recent decades compared to the period prior to 1980. 12 of the last four of the 14 warmest years in the instrumental record have all occurred in this century, etc., etc. Some would argue, if you recall the curve a moment ago, that temperature increases have leveled off in the last decade. It's not the case. What we're seeing is that decadal changes in ocean circulation are resulting in a much greater heat uptake in the oceans, less so in the atmosphere. The Earth's energy gain, that's to say the net gain of energy on the planet is almost a half a watt, a little more than a half a watt per meter squared on a continuous basis, and this is equivalent to exploding 400,000 Hiroshima-type atomic bombs every day, 365 days a year. That's the world in which we live. Recent findings turn the screws. We are on track for a 650 parts per million uh, carbon dioxide equivalent increase in uh, atmospheric greenhouse gases. This is equivalent to roughly four, could be six degrees of mean global warming, which would be absolutely catastrophic, displacing hundreds of millions, if not billions of people from coastlines and habitable landscape, to, uh, landscapes that are currently habitable that would be converted to desert. The only way we can turn this around is if OECD countries agree immediately to a 6% reduction per annum in their carbon emissions. Mostly we're increasing, and this would really require a planned economic recession. Even the World Bank is opening up and waking up to this reality. In a recent report, they stated point blank, the projected four degree warming simply must not be allowed to occur. Well, what is the history? The history shows that despite the dire warnings of science for many decades, despite the increasing getting on board by major international institutions, fossil fuel use continues to grow continuously, particularly, obviously, in developing countries. Moreover, most analysts see that fossil fuels will continue to be the energy basis for global civilization for the foreseeable future, so that by 2013, the renewable sources that were not subsidizing adequately, not allowing to develop, and so on, 
uh, will only constitute about uh, 6% of the energy budget uh, compared to about less than 3% today. So clearly, we're seeing a situation in which we're simply projecting the existing catastrophic circumstances well into the future. I mentioned the possibility of economic problems as well. Pardon me. These graphs show the state of affairs in conventional energy sources. We're seeing in the last several years a half a trillion dollars of investment by the, some of the three largest oil companies on the planet, leading to no increase and indeed falling production, clear diminishing returns. Conventional oil has peaked and is in decline at the rate of about 4% per year. New discoveries have not matched consumption since as far back as 1986. Better technology is raising the amount we can recover, but conventional production is still falling at that 4% per year. 37 countries have passed post-peak already, and we need the new production of a new Saudi Arabia every three to four years just to maintain and grow supply. It's not happening. And liquid, uh, natural gas liquids and uh, artificial crude, such as we get from Alberta oil sands, are barely maintaining global supplies so that we're in an undulating plateau that may well begin to decline shortly. The same is true for the major minerals underpinning global society. If you read about this, it'll scare the pants off you, but the facts of the matter are that increasing investment is not leading to greater discoveries or production of the key minerals underpinning global society. Renewable energy, because of a lack of investment, the technology is available, we could do it. But the fact is that right now, practical substitutes for petroleum in key areas must satisfy these criteria. They haven't made it yet. Cheap, abundant, increasingly available, transformable into a liquid portable flu flu pardon me, fuel similar to oil, and non-polluting. Any form of renewable energy, understand this because it is key, any form of renewable energy that cannot economically both produce itself and all the infrastructure required to make it, as well as provide all of the energy surpluses needed for everything else in society, is not a viable alternative to petroleum. Petroleum. So far, no form of uh, renewable energy meets these criteria, and indeed, in total, the alternative sources are no substitute for fossil fuel. If that's true, this is the future we may well be facing because of a combination of uneconomic growth resulting in catastrophic changes to the world's climate and everything that that impacts, as well as the economic problems I've already mentioned of diminishing returns, competition for capital resources, and so on and so forth. The bottom line, it seems to me, from this global perspective in which Canada is embedded is quite simple. In coming years, it is highly likely, based on history, current trends, and just about everything the analysts in these domains are telling us, the human enterprise will likely contract. We're on an undulating plateau right now, which, now, which may last for a few more years. But the point is, an intelligent, forward-looking, plan-capable moral species could theoretically change this situation. We have a choice between business as usual, which risks a chaotic implosion, either imposed by nature or economic upheaval, followed by geopolitical turmoil and resource wars, all of which are out there in miniature at the present time. Or we can come together, exercising those most human of qualities, high intelligence, the capacity to cooperate, the capacity to plan forward, and we can engineer an orderly cooperative descent toward a socially just sustainability for all. It's our choice. A recent study just last week concluded collapse can be avoided and population can reach equilibrium if the per capita rate of depletion of nature is reduced to a sustainable level, we've got to get out of overshoot, and if resources are distributed in an equitable and a reasonably equitable fashion. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Rowan. And I'd like to begin, begin by making a confession, a personal confession. I have an addiction. That's right, I have an addiction. I'm, I am addicted to fossil fuels. I have had this addiction my entire life. And you know what's insidious about this addiction is that it permeates every single aspect of my life. And I'll just give you an example. I took my two young daughters 
to their swimming class the other, the other night to uh, our local community center. And while we drove using fossil fuel, and we get to the pool, and I realized that every bit of their swim gear, from their bathing suits to their nylon bags to their plastic goggles, are made of fossil fuels. The pool is heated by a natural gas-fired boiler in the basement of the community center, fossil fuel, and even the organic snack at the end of the swimming lesson has been transported over 2,000 kilometers from where it's made to my house by fossil fuel. So, yes, I'm addicted to fossil fuel, and I'm going to guess that most of you are as well. By 2050, there will be 9 billion people on this planet, <clears throat> and every reasonable estimate I've seen shows that fossil fuel consumption, production and consumption, is going to rise to meet our consumption. Well, it's not all bad because cheap hydrocarbons have, have in large measure, created a very high standard of living for us here in Western Canada. But unless we're prepared to put our standard of living on the table, I'm going to guess that we're going to have to innovate like crazy to tackle today's energy problems and create a sustainable energy future. Now, one of the great fringe benefits of being a tech entrepreneur is that we get to imagine, we have the luxury to imagine the world uh, in a completely different form. And we get to think about how to solve the unsolvable problem. So with that, I'm going to pitch you on an idea and a vision that I'm quite passionate about. And it goes something like this. On the one hand, in British Columbia, we've got a globally competitive technology industry. We've got incredible talent. We've got access to capital. We've got global connections. And we are in the business of solving problems. On the other hand, we've got a massive oil and gas industry in Alberta that needs some pretty significant solutions to some very large environmental problems. And I believe we've got a, an opportunity in Western Canada to connect the dots strategically and intentionally between our technology industry on the one hand and our oil and gas industry on the other hand to create an unholy alliance and a global energy hub of innovation. The objective would be to build a vibrant innovation economy of entrepreneurs, early adopters, venture capital, to develop game-changing solutions to the most difficult environmental problems facing the oil and gas industry, including water use, greenhouse gas emissions, um, land management, plus develop game-changing solutions to our long-term sustainable energy future to reduce our addiction to fossil fuel. Imagine if we could pull this off. We could inspire the world's best and brightest people from all over the world, whether it's Israel or California or China, to come to Western Canada with their energy and their ideas to solve these problems. Here's a few data points. Let's start with the BC tech industry. It's booming. Over the past 10 years, it has emerged as uh, a dominant economic uh, engine of growth for British Columbia. It's been the fastest job creator in our province. Today, it employs more than 80,000 people directly. That's more than the mining industry, the forest products industry, and the energy industry in British Columbia combined. It generates $20 billion a year in revenue and contributes 12% of our exports. BC is consistently ranked as a top 10 global startup hub. Clean tech is the newest and one of the fastest growing segments of our technology industry with hundreds of companies and thousands of employees developing solutions as diverse as smart grid technologies, uh, renewable energy technologies, water solutions, and a whole variety of other technologies. And these are not just nice ideas. Sorry. These are not just nice, uh, nice ideas. One of the most impressive achievements of our technology industry is that these products are highly competitive and are sought after and bought by multinational corporations around the world, some of the largest companies in the world. On the other side of the Rockies, the oil and gas industry has been booming as well. It's no secret that Western Canada is one, has one of the largest reserves of unconventional oil and gas in the, in the world. And this industry has played a dominant role in the development of Western Canada. The scale of capital being invested in Alberta is breathtaking, $40 billion a year annually. 
However, we also know that this industry faces some significant environmental challenges throughout the value chain. Water, greenhouse gas emissions um, are all ultimately threatening the oil industry's social license to operate, their access to market, and their access to capital, and their long-term competitiveness. So here's the connection. Oil and gas need solutions. The tech sector can, pl can supply innovation horsepower to, de to develop and commercialize these solutions. And you know what's awesome about this idea? It's already starting to happen. Let me tell you about some of the BC clean tech companies that are already making an impact. Many of you probably heard of, of Westport Innovations. This is a global leader in the conversion of, of trucks and fleets from diesel fuel to natural gas. This technology is fully commercial. It's been exported all over the world. Saltworks is another BC technology company formed a few years ago. This is a world leader in desalinization, and this technology is being applied in the oil sands to reduce the volume of fresh water being used for mining uh, and, and developing oil sands reserves. And then there's General Fusion, another BC technology company. The founder, Mike LeBurge, uh, spoke at the TED Talks last week, uh, did a fantastic job. This is the, this is the uh, holy grail of, of energy uh, with uh, fusion technology, very, very low cost energy and, and, and fully sustainable. It's a big swing in our industry and, and we wish them luck. And there are many other uh, companies. Uh, Inventus is, is leading the way in, uh, in developing low-cost uh, carbon capture and reuse technology. My company, Axine Water Technologies, is using uh, fuel cell derivatives to uh, treat toxic wastewater in, uh, in the oil and gas industry. So in closing, um, BC technology plus oil and gas innovation could be a game changer with the potential to dramatically improve the, improve the uh, environmental performance of our oil and gas industry today and create a pathway for long-term sustainable energy. Many years ago, a fellow by the name of Buckminster Fuller uh, said that there's, there's really nothing in a caterpillar that tells you that it will become a, a butterfly. It's an inspiring quote that I've, I've kept nearby. And I think it might be possible and time to let our energy butterfly out of its cocoon. Thank you very much. Technology. <laughs> One second here. <laughs> Darn. Yeah, it was supposed to not come up until <laughs> Oh, there we go. Yay! <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Kaylee Taylor. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you tonight. This is my fourth time speaking with the Walrus, which is a huge honor. And every time I'm preparing for my talks, I get inspired by this mantra that Walrus has up on their website. They aim to be fearless, witty, thoughtful, and Canadian. And every time I look at that, I think that's exactly what I want to be in my talks as well. Unfortunately, I can only guarantee one of them. Uh, <laughs> But, <laughs> so, I, but I, I can do that, and I'm hoping that I can achieve all four. So today, I, I want to take a bit of a broader approach and look at how I think our generation can change the way that energy is viewed and, and the way that we approach it. And I know that we're here in Canada, we're in Van beautiful Vancouver, but I want to start in a place a little bit different. I want to start in Rio de Janeiro. So my, many of you may have heard that in 2012, there was the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. For those of you who follow these types of initiatives, this is a big global gathering of leaders from all over the world who get together to talk about sustainability and figure out how 7 billion people can coexist on the planet. 
And I was invited down to the Earth Summit. Now, this summit is a 20-year anniversary event of the 1992 Earth Summit that happened. And given that I was only four years old at the time of that first summit, I thought it was important that I did some research going into it to figure out exactly what came out of the first one and how much progress we had made. So I came across a summary report from the 1992 summit that was published by the Canadian government. And in it, there were three barriers that were listed as challenges in achieving a sustainable future. And they were lack of targets and timetables for stabilizing emissions, strong opposition to the reduction of fossil fuel use from oil producing nations, tensions between the rich and the poor being at the heart of every negotiation. So I'm gonna pause here for a second and remind everyone that this is the outcomes from the 1992 Earth Summit. Do those look familiar? That is exactly the picture that we face today. So what troubled me was that not only have we made very little progress since 1992, but in fact, those positions have become even more entrenched and polarized. And it should concern us all that history is repeating itself. But don't worry, I'm not here to be some doomsday speaker. I believe that history repeats itself until it doesn't. And until we have something that comes along, whether that's a shock or a generation, that can change the course. And so today, I wanna to talk about four things that I think we all can do when it comes to energy, four things that I think we all can internalize in order to make that transition. First, we need to humanize energy. I think it's so important that we start shifting the dialogue away from how do we get more cheap, abundant, reliable energy to what energy is there for. Last I checked, no one actually cares about barrels of oil as big black goop. They care about being transported to and from places. Last I checked, no one actually cared about solar panels because they're a piece of plastic and some wires. They care about solar because it allows children in India to stay up two hours later a night and study, or to check the fields at night without risk of being bitten by a snake. Energy is a means to an end, not an end in itself. And we really need to remember that when we're looking at solutions or else we'll limit ourselves in the solutions that we can achieve. We need to raise the level of discourse around energy. Right now, there is a ton of label setting, stone throwing, and just general polarization that's causing people to feel backed against a wall and take sides. I often joke that I'm a hippie in a suit because my left-wing friends think I'm a corporate sellout and my right-wing friends think I'm a tree hugger. And I'm completely happy to play that middle space because I don't think any of us would argue that we want a vibrant economy and a healthy environment and a future for ourselves. And we need to stop putting labels on each other because at some points we all want those things and we need to work towards solutions to achieving them. We need to create immediacy, relevancy, and community around energy. First of all, with immediacy, this always seems to be the next generation's problem. Someone will fix it eventually but it needs to happen now and someone needs to take responsibility. I believe that can be our generation and I believe we can do it, but we need to start recognizing the facts and listening to the numbers that have been presented and seeing the scale and impact that this problem could have. Around relevancy, we have to show people what this means in their lives and not just talk about these things as a million tons of CO2. What's a million tons? What's 250,000 barrels? Those things don't mean things to people. We need to put it in their own terms. And we need to create communities around these issues and get people talking and thinking about solutions. And finally, we need to empower the next generation. Because right now, globally, we're setting 2030, 2050 targets, and it doesn't take long to do the math and realize that the people setting those targets won't be the ones achieving them. It will be people under the age of 30 that will be on the ground making those things happen. It's so important that we build that capacity in my generation in order to do that. And we want a stake, we care about these things, and we want to push the needle and challenge the status quo. I recently heard a really, really great quote about approaching the future. And it is that when you approach the future, you should approach it with your head in the clouds and your feet on the ground. 
And what that refers to is with your head in the clouds, you're always keeping vision of what you ultimately want, being incredibly optimistic, positive, having that ultimate view of what it is that you want to achieve. But with your feet on the ground, you're pragmatic, you're sensible, you're looking at the barriers that are around you and you're finding out ways to break them down. That's what we need with energy and that's what I hope I can leave you all with tonight. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Arlene Strom. I'm from Suncor Energy. And I'd like to start by thanking all of our guest speakers tonight for your thoughtful and passionate perspectives on energy. Uh, I'm pretty sure I speak for all of us when I say that you have really challenged us tonight with with your, with your thoughts and perspectives. But I'm also encouraged and optimistic, and I'll tell you why. First of all, I had the opportunity to sit upstairs in the green room with each of these speakers tonight, and if you could have heard the interaction going on between them. These were people who perhaps didn't agree, but they were willing to share passionately their perspectives. They believed that we needed to get to solutions, and we believe that at Suncor too. Um, it's why that we really value our partnership with the Walrus Foundation. They believe that as Canadians, it's important that we have national conversations about these important topics. And certainly there couldn't be a more important topic than our energy future. I couldn't possibly, you know, I'm still soaking in all of what I've heard tonight. But there were a few themes that I just want to quickly run over. One is the complexity of our energy system. You know, we heard about the political complexity, the challenges of climate change, the climate bear. And we've heard about how important it is to consider indigenous rights in this conversation. We also heard about, several of our speakers talked about innovation and collaboration and how important those two things are going to be to get to solutions. And finally, um, I think I loved the optimistic note that Callie ended for us with um, when she said, you know, we need to get to solutions. We need to avoid labels on one another. She talked about happily taking that role in the center. Well, I think as long as we're having these kinds of conversations and we're talking about solutions, we can avoid that polarization that, that does not lead to uh, moving forward on a positive energy future. So with that, John was kind enough to say, check out Oscar. I would encourage you to do that. We like to think that Oscar gives you not only Suncor's perspective, but it also gives you access to what other people are saying and thinking about energy, oil sands question and response. We've had some guest writers that, uh, that give other perspectives, and so you'll hear from others when you, when you tune in and sign in to, uh, to Oscar. So finally, thank you to the Walrus Foundation for facilitating and partnering with us on these talks. Uh, thank you to, again, to each of the speakers and to SFU and the Gold Corp Center for the Arts for hosting this, this evening. Uh, I know that the next step is going to be even more interesting, and that's where I hope all of you will join us at a reception in the World Art Center. If you go outside, either at the doors at the top of the uh, stairs or just to the right here, there will be people there who can direct you. The, um, the reception is actually on this floor, so if you go out there, you'll have to go down the stairs. But thank you so much for being with us tonight, and thank you for being part of a conversation about energy.